Greetings, Reclaimers. I am 343 Guilty Spark, monitor of Podcast Evolved. Protocol dictates that you must listen. Come. We have a wealth of knowledge to share with you, and you don't want to make my blue eye red. Do you, Reclaimers? Welcome, Spartans, to another Halo Book Club, part of Podcast Evolved, your home for Halo. I am your host, Oren, and with me today, we have Aaron. Hi, guys. David. Hello, everybody. And Krista. Hello. This month's book club is uh, Wages of Sin from the Halo Evolutions uh, Collective of Short Stories. It's a volume two uh, exclusive, so if you get the different volumes... This uh, appears in the Volume 2 edition as opposed to the Volume 1, so if you missed it, that might be why. And so we're going to talk about today, but before we get started, we want to remind everyone to check out our awesome website, halopodcastevolve.com or halopodcast.com. It features all of our past Halo book clubs as well as our other shows and all of their episodes such as Podcast Evolve, which is our weekly show that alternates between lore discussions and the latest Halo news. We have Mission Debrief, which is a deep dive into every Halo games campaign, mission by mission, and Builds with Blocks, which is centered around our micro action figures and brick-based construction sets within the Halo universe. So you can check those out and discover your new favorite show. We have a Patreon page if you care to support us. We offer a variety of exclusive rewards to our patrons like early episodes, swag, as well as a evolved album and soundtrack that you can listen to. We want to take a moment to thank all of our patrons for their continued support. Thank you guys so much. Uh, you really keep more than the lights lights on. You do more than that, actually, in the recent months. So thank you so much for your generosity. We couldn't do this show without you. And finally, we encourage our listeners to support Audible, listening to the growing collection of Halo novels all in one place, along with thousands of other novels, podcasts, guide us wellness programs, Audible Originals, and more, and you can use the URL audibletrial.com forward slash podcast evolve to learn more and start your free trial today. All right, everybody, Wages of Sin. It's another short story We're on, the, on the shorter side of the other short stories within the Evolutions collection. We don't have an author, to my knowledge. Uh, it's the guy, it's this guy, the prophet of Oh, that's right, discovery. yes, it's, it's the minister, yes. Yeah, minister of discovery. He wrote it. In his dying moments, and he's like, I don't know why I'm writing this, no one's gonna fucking read it. <laughs> and right right after he wrote it, he sent it via the, um, the domain, um, it was published by Tor Books, and then, uh, again by Simon, Simon and Schuster in 2019. Really nice of them. Yeah, very, very nice of them. They're, they're really into his confessions and final final declarations. Like I said, it's an exclusive to Volume 2, and it came out in November 3rd, or sorry, November 30th of 2010, and then it was re-released in the 2019 edition on April 16th, 2019. See, the story takes place around November 3rd, 2552, because that's when the Master Chief is trudging through High Charity as the Grave Mines and the Flood are overtaking High Charity. And we have a Minister of Discovery, a, a San Shayun, who is locked away in his sort of quarters and feels a lot of regret for what's going on, pun unintended. And he decides to write down a confession. It's pretty interesting. I really enjoyed this piece because it kind of validates that the prophet's knew they were being deceptive and you know maybe some were you know truly believed more than others but you definitely had ministers and prophets who knew that they were lying to the rest of the covenant to kind of further their means to do this great journey and activate the halo array so i guess we could just kind of go around and talk about different things here because he kind of kind of breaks up 
what he is like sorry about and these different, you know, he says, I have many confessions. I'm sorry I stole your chocolate milk. (laughs) But I think the most interesting one that we can kind of jump off off of is that he admits that it was kind of his leadership that eventually led to the Covenant Party on Installation 4 to discover where the Flood were locked away and ultimately releasing them kind of in that swamp area. And like, although he wasn't there, he like straight up, it says that like he led and so he he feels... Well, I feel kind of bad because now I'm going to get killed by the thing <laughs> I released. Well, it's pretty unique to find, like, a sense of who gives a shit or that he would feel this level of regret of what he's released. And I think it was, like, obviously the fact that High Charity was laid low, it, it kind, of, kind of really hammers home what he's done. The thing about it that I find kind of funny is he's like, yes, we saw every single warning sign. We read every single one. We read all the warning signs, but we still drank the bleach because we thought it would be fun. We thought we could live through it. They still believe in their own hype. Yeah. He kind of talks about how truth in that thought, it was still something they could control because they deep down didn't believe that the Flood was intelligent. Well, they didn't even believe it was like that big of a threat. Yeah, I think like you get the feeling they thought this is a bioweapon. We can control it. It'll be fine. And then he's looking out the window going, things were not fine. (laughs) (laughs) It's like that meme of the dog sitting in the room and the room's on fire and he's like, this is fine. But then right after that, he says like, oh, you know what? It really wasn't fine and it's all my fault. That was the turning point in my life when I let out the deadly virus that killed everyone. That's definitely one of the things I'm thinking I might be regretting a little bit. The minister kind of goes on and he talks about some of these lies and and sort of manipulations. And so he touches on like the Arbiter and how like the role of the Arbiter used to be this very honorable position that the Sangheili held and literally the Sanshayun just completely manipulated it into like a badge of uh, like disdain and dishonorable position. But then with with the irony of that, it was the Thelvedam Arbiter that ended up discovering a lot of the lies that the prophets were telling, which eventually led to, well, that and some other things that he kind of touches in as well that led to the Great Schism and the overall downfall of the Covenant. But uh, he talks about how they never should have let the Jirohane in and how they were not intelligent and the Seng Sahili were just so much better sort of followers of, of them and even talks about like AI, how they just completely cast aside AI because they didn't they don't want people to be, or anything that be smarter and the saying Chayun. So there's a lot of like enlightenment here that kind of just reinforces the deception that the, the prophets kind of had and bestowed upon the covenant and the other alien races. When he's talking about some of the historical stuff, did you get a vibe or impression that I'm sure it's maybe changed later, but like they had less knowledge of how the dreadnought worked than we like associate with them now? He kind of gives the impression that they kind of didn't have much of a clue, really. I know they do have so many talks about how they've been able to replicate some forerunner technology, but not as well. But, like, I got a distinct vibe when he talks about how had they the power of the Dreadnought to wield, they could have controlled the galaxy. And I was like, but you did have the power of the Dreadnought. Well, I feel like he was saying that the the power of the Dreadnought was locked within the Dreadnought. Like, the way I kind of interpreted it is that if they were able to re- replicate the weaponry of the Dreadnought and put them in their Covenant ships, then they would literally just have com- you know, complete control over the galaxy and kind of whoever came in their way. Okay, that makes a bit more sense. I was reading that and going like, am I, am I reading this right? Am I reading this wrong? Because they literally used the Dreadnought to fight the Sang- the Sanghealy and eventually reach a thing still. That's where I was a bit stumped. And then sometimes I get confused then I'm like, was this one of these short stories written before those other stories and they didn't have this bit of background fleshed out? Because I know we read Con and Tweak a few things, so maybe it was just one of those, but okay, that makes more sense. I like when he touches on humanity in this, why humanity weren't allowed into the Covenant and the people that questioned why they weren't allowed in and how they were potentially equals to the Sanjayum or like better. Yeah, that's definitely one of the most interesting kind of aspects of it because it's one of the things you, you've got to have asked when, like, and definitely like other races you think about ask because you see some of the races they take into the Covenant 
and they're like useless or to the borderline of being pointless. You don't hear about them wiping out species. It's just they immediately went on the um the offensive with humanity. Now we know why, but it's kind of interesting to see like why it's a covenant and everything about it. Obviously, people have. Well, that really is an interesting note because the kind of inner circles know that the deeper meaning that the forerunners wanted humanity. And like you said, we know that. Yeah, you got to imagine that. Uh, you know, the Kigyar and the Grunts are just talking one day, and they're like, you know, why aren't the humans fighting with us? It's interesting to think that this is taking place the same time as, why do I always blank on the name of it, the Shipmaster story, the Joseph Staten one. Shadow of Intent. Shadow of Intent. Like, this is happening around the same time that the prelate, isn't that who it is, that is having, like, his nightmares about his wife and child being consumed by the wave of flood. Like, he's sitting... The, the Minister of Discovery sitting in his suite looking out the window watching the same wave of flood just wash its way over the city. Yeah. And like he's taking stock of things and realising he's been the shitty guy all along. And he also like <laughs> the interesting kind of comedy has as well of like what's left of his race and where they are where like he's pretty much saying the majority of them were consumed by flood. Some of them might have got off planet and the rest of them will be killed by Jirohane or humans or fucking Sangheili. Yeah, I think he said he thinks some of them will be safe with the Jarl Hanai because they're going to need the prophets to build them gear. Yeah, they're going to be reliant on the technology that the prophets have intimate knowledge of. I kind of like the idea of prophets ending up as slaves to the brutes building them equipment. Like slave scientists? Yeah. Just fulfilling the role of like shitty grunts <laughs> building shit for them. There's something satisfying about that. Well, do we think, like, the Banished have done anything with them? I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. I think the Banished will probably come across them at some stage. I think the Banished would just kill them. Yeah. Well, I kind of feel like if they want to join the Banished, Atriox is sort of open to anyone. If they were serious about it, I feel like Atriox would let them. Well, the Shadows of Intent book, as funny you brought it up, actually would kind of did introduce, uh, like, a, a sect of Sanshium that would be interesting in the Vanish to see. Those, like, crazy, the kind of combat unit. Prelites? Prelates? Something like that, I think it was. Yeah. I think he was called something like that. I like the idea of a funky, banished prophet. <laughs> banished armor, being able to fight. That would be, that would be cool. Stick him in a mech suit. Yeah. I mean, those are kind of the notes that, that I sort of had, just kind of the the deception that, that was kind of put in motion by the Sangheili, saying that, like, they, they admitting that they lied about X, Y, and Z, and just, like, they're, 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 there's a reason for everything. Like, why they didn't work with AIs, why they didn't like humanity, and why they kept being persistent on this, and it was... I don't know, just kind of further solidified the deception, so... It was cool just to see one of the Sanctuary say all these things. I thought that that was kind of the most interesting takeaway from this, is just having him break down the different aspects of the war and, like, the different races and even his own and seeing the shortcomings of his own race. Almost like all of the shit they fucked up. They're like, well, start it. for starters, we fucked up our own planet and we fucked up the elites... And we fucked up everybody else we came across. Then we fucked up the humans, and then we <laughs> fucked up the entire universe with the flood. But then at the very end going, oh, the hunters will probably be fine. <laughs> yeah, that... <laughs> hey, I had that quote right here, actually. <laughs> Who knows what the silent Megalagola will do? They might even survive the parasite. <laughs> and now we know that they are immune, so they will survive. Do we think the Minister of Discovery lived... <laughs> No, because he, he said it, he, he embraced them with open arms after at the end. Aww, maybe that changed the flood and, like, softened their hearts and now they're best buds. No, he's another talking head on a tentacle like regret. <laughs> True. No one can leave until my sermon is complete. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's where he ends up. The other thing I liked it was when he sort of refers to Mendigan Bias as... Like, he describes him almost as, like, this insane oracle, and you're like, he's not insane, he knows the truth. I thought he was referring to the oracle inside. That's not medical bias, the one that's in High Charity, in the Dreadnought? In Dreadnought? That was a fracture of Medicant. Yeah. It's a fragment. 
He is the one that whenever they discover the humans on Harvest, he tries to take the Dreadnought out of High Charity to go and meet them. And then they cut him off and isolate him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, I'm going home to my masters. Whee! The reclaimers are here. The reclaimers are here. Ah, uh, fuck you guys, you weirdos. The idea that they think he's insane and you're like, no, no, he, he was the most sane. And if you had have listened to him. But then again, if they listened to him, they'd have had to give up their power. So that's like the end of it all. Is He, he says at one stage, like the Sansayum are too impatient and too greedy for their own good. I think it's when he's talking about the war with the Sangheili and how the Sansayum could have eventually won. They could have like developed their technology because the elites weren't willing to like violate the Forerunner stuff. And he's like, we could have won that eventually, but we were too impatient. So we made peace instead and like sort of put them into subservience and that backfired. Or not even that. Like, I think he was saying that they were too impatient to even do peace. And that's when they broke out into war. And then when war didn't really work, then they're like, all right, then let's peace. Let's peace it up and, and join forces. <laughs> <laughs> the writ of union. That'll solve all our problems. Yeah. Enter the brutes. Enter the brutes. Which he says they shouldn't have done. But he even, he even says that, like, you know, most don't believe that the... That the flood and the parasite is uh, is intelligent, but then he says like, no, they're like calculated and they know exactly what they're doing and they don't destroy, but they consume, and so it's just like it's it's amazing how much knowledge they have, but you have these three high prophets that just literally controlled everything, and it's just yeah, it makes you wonder like who else had these sort of thoughts and if they were silenced or how much they really vocalized or if they were just blind followers. Yeah, and like when you think about the fact that. This is the guy that unlocked the same door that Keys would eventually walk through and get eaten. This guy's responsible for Keys' death. Oh, we found him. We found the bastard. Well, at least he got what was coming to him because he fucked off before the work was done and went back to his ship. <laughs> yeah, he was like, eh, I don't feel like opening that spooky door. He heard the, like, flood music start as they end as they got near the door and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you guys do that, actually. I ha I left my oven on. Do you think he's called the Minister of Discovery for discovering the Flood, or do you think that was something that he earned before that? It was probably the Halo, really. Oh, it said that he had it for like 214 cycles, that title. So he's had it for a good long while. He So he's discovered many things. Here's a thought. Do we think, as Minister of Discovery, is this the Covenant equivalent of Dr. Halsey? Is this like the inept, stupid head of research who was not a good Halsey and fucked it all up and is now sitting there going, I've made terrible mistakes? Yeah, probably. Maybe to an extent. I can I can buy that. He opened the doors, man. He opened the doors. This is what happened. He opened the door. He opened the floodgate. <laughs> we've got Halsey. We've got sexy Halsey. Now we've got Prophet Halsey. We got s stupid Halsey, yeah. Dead Prophet Halsey. Next up, we need to see Brute Halsey. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, my. Anything else, guys? I, I really enjoyed this story. This was a, a nice little nugget of information and perspective. Sucks to suck, loser. Minister of Discovery. I like the Covenant stuff. I like these things. Broken Circle and that. If you tell me later that Joe Staten wrote this, I'll totally believe it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe so. But we all know it was the Minister himself. Yes. It's canon. Well, we'll go ahead and end it there, dear listeners. Thank you for joining us. You can find every episode of all of our shows and all the other past Halo book clubs on our website, halopodcastevolve.com, like I mentioned at the top of the show. Our website also features links to our Discord server, Facebook group, Patreon page, Xbox Live Club, as well as other contact information for you to reach out to us. If you want to leave us a voicemail about this episode, share your thoughts about the Minister of Discovery or just about other episodes that you've listened to in the past or other book clubs, you can give us a call at 205-EVOLVED, which is 205-386-5833, and we will show and present your voicemail on one of our news and community episodes, and we will respond to it. It'll be amazing. And with that, everybody, I've been your host, Oren, and until next book club, Evolved! Evolved! Evolved.